All right, so what you're looking at, believe it or not, is a real human skeleton. And I just want you to take a quick look at this thing because as you do, it's gonna look quite a bit different than what you're used to in your health class, right? That's because bones have individual character to them. And what I wanna show you is something called spongy bone. And if you look really closely, you can see how on the inside of the bone, it looks like a sponge. And that's where you're gonna find a lot of red bone marrow. But bone has character to it. It's not just this stale type of rock sitting inside of your body. It is alive and very, very cool. Let's talk about a muscle that most people have heard of called the pectoralis major muscle. Now, if you're doing the bench press, you're primarily targeting this muscle and trying to get it to be big, like you want big pecs. But what a lot of people don't know is that it has a little brother. There is another pec muscle called pectoralis minor just underneath it. Kind of crazy that you have two different pec muscles. So many of you probably heard someone say, ah, I tore my rotator cuff. Well, the thing is the rotator cuff is really four muscles. The first one is up here called supraspinatus. The next one is right here, and that's called infraspinatus. The super slender one is teres minor, and then if we flip it onto the back side, we can even see another one called subscapularis. So the problem is, when you say I tore my rotator cuff, well, which one? I used to think the Achilles tendon was only that big, but in reality, it is this big. In fact, it goes up nearly half or more the length of your entire calf. This is the strongest tendon in the human body. So if we're looking at these bones of your back, these are called vertebrae, and then this chunk right here, these are called spinous processes, and you can feel this if you drag your finger down your back. But if we look up here in the cervical region, you're gonna see a very unique shape to the spinous process. It's split. We call that a bifid process. And what this splitting does is allows for this spinous process to run into the one inferior to it, but instead of just literally slamming into it, it starts to mold to it, kind of like a saddle would on a horse's back. This is so that when you're extending your neck, it doesn't run into it. It's a really cool property that these cervical vertebrae have. I wanna show you what your rib cage looks like on the inside. So if I were to go ahead and turn this around, what we'll notice is we can see the sternum here with blood vessels on either side. This is kinda of cool. I can even see some spongy bone on that sternum but we can also notice there's like this glossy sheen on the inside of the ribs, right? That's just gonna be connective tissue, but really interesting shimmer that it has. And then we also have the inside of your rectus abdominis or your six pack muscle, which you really can't see much of the muscle tissue, but yeah, that's what your rib cage looks like on the inside. So what I have here is a cross section of a real human thigh. Now, why I like these cross sections is because it allows you to see a lot of anatomy at once, such as the femur, the quadriceps, the hamstrings, and the adductors. We can see blood vessels and all these white connective tissue lines that separate each muscle from one another. Cross sections are very useful when studying anatomy. Here we are again with this real human skeleton, and I want to look at this bone right here called the hyoid bone. So you can see that it's suspended with this metal, but that's really its actual location. This is the only floating bone in the body. You see, this is in your voice box or your larynx, and it's embedded with cartilage and suspended with muscle. So kind of cool that this bone right here is floating. Now, if you want to feel it, you can squeeze the side of your Adam's apple. And as you swallow, you're going to feel it go up and then it's going to go down. Really cool, unique bone. So what you're looking at here is the back of the thigh. And these are the hamstrings. You see, the hamstrings are really three muscles. We have biceps femoris, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus. But what's kind of cool is if I push them in like this, something emerges from behind them. And this is the sciatic nerve. You see, the sciatic nerve is really two nerves bundled together. But what happens is it normally splits down here in the knee. But the sciatic nerve is hiding behind your hamstrings. Let's talk about the shape of joints. So we're looking at a real human skeleton foot here, but I wanna focus on this second toe, and you can see it right next to this big toe right here. But if we look at this rounded portion, we call that a convex shape. And you'll notice that it has a corresponding concave shape. That's this dip, right? Kind of like this valley. And what you'll notice is that these two shapes match up very well with one another, and that allows for a lot of mobility. But not every joint in the body has that shape. 
We don't have to go far to see that. You can see these other ankle bones don't really have that really nice concave and convex shape. And that's because they're not going to move in the same way that this joint is going to move. I want to talk about how anatomy can be an imperfect science sometimes. You see, this is the muscle called latissimus dorsi, and there's a genetic variability that this particular cadaver has. You see, this is the scapula or shoulder blade, and if you notice, latissimus dorsi is going on top of it. I'm kind of putting my finger around the inferior angle of the scapula. That doesn't happen in everybody. Not everyone has this muscle go on top of the scapula. So the question is why? What kind of advantage could that do? And if we move the scapula, you can see that that muscle would almost act like a strap, keeping it or helping to keep it attached to your axial skeleton. Let's talk about your IT band. You see, this thing has become something of a celebrity these days with everybody foam rolling it like there's no tomorrow. But what you need to understand is that this is a uniquely human tissue. You see, your femurs don't come straight up and down like this. In reality, they come at an angle. We call that the quadriceps angle. But what that means is that the center of the bone experiences more bending force and could possibly break. So what happened is your body developed this tension strut, this piece of tissue that goes down on the side like this called the IT band. So the fact is the IT band is supposed to be tight. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be able to help distribute the forces that the thigh is experiencing. Now, can it be too tight? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean you'd want to foam roll out the IT band itself. Instead, you'd want to focus on the muscles right here, like the TFL or the gluteus maximus that connect to it, that if the muscles are tight, then this itself would get tighter. Today I want to talk about a muscle that most everyone has heard of, and that's the biceps brachii muscle. Now, the reason why it's called biceps that means two heads. We have a split. You see, we have two different heads that form one muscle called the biceps brachii. Let's use this real human skeleton to talk about bone marrow transplants. You see this area of the hip? This is a common location for them to insert a needle, which would then extract bone marrow stem cells. You see, bone marrow is necessary in order to make blood cells, like red blood cells and white blood cells, which carry oxygen and fight off infections. Let's talk about Charlie horses or muscle cramps. You see all these little fibers? They run all the way up the length of the muscle belly, and inside of there are a bunch of proteins, and those proteins cause the fibers to shorten or contract. So you can kind of picture this contracting to get shorter. In a Charlie horse or muscle cramp, something is causing these fibers to contract when you're not supposed to, and even more importantly, it refuses to let go. So a lot of times people will do stretching and try to just literally physically separate the proteins from one another, but it could even be an electrolyte imbalance. The fact is, we just don't really know what causes Charlie horses or muscle cramps. Some of you are missing this muscle called palmaris longus. It could be in your right arm and not in your left, or in your left arm and not in your right. Or you could be missing both of them or have both of them in your arms. So let's show a test to see if you have palmaris longus. So for this first test, you're gonna take your arm and your hand and you're gonna rest them on a flat surface. Then you're gonna make a fist and then you're going to flex. And when you see this tendon pop up, that tells you you have a palmaris longus. Now, to make it a more definitive test, take your ring finger and your thumb Smash them together as hard as you can and then flex and you should be able to feel two tendons popping out. If you only have one tendon, you might be missing palmaris longus. What you're looking at here is a real human skull. Now, as I get closer to it, you're going to immediately notice that it looks much different than any plastic skull you've probably seen before in your life. But what I want to focus on is this thing. This is called the foramen magnum. It literally means big hole. And this is where the end of the brainstem, the medulla oblongata, and the, and the spinal cord exit the cranium, and then they go down the back. But there's just a gigantic hole at the base of your occipital bone. So everybody wants that nice six pack, that nice toned chiseled core is really targeting this muscle here called the rectus abdominis. But the thing is, it's not really a six pack. There's really eight. See, they have one, two, three, and four. And there would be an additional four on this side that's just covered in connective tissue. So that means every single one of us has an eight pack. What you're looking at is the knee. We see the patella, the quadriceps tendon, the patellar ligament, but what's really cool, watch this, is wild. I cut this so I can reflect it back. Now that pink stuff, that happens occasionally as the embalming process interacts with the soft tissue, but you can see the posterior aspect of the patella as well as this smooth surface of the femur that the patella would glide on as you are flexing and extending your knee. But this is what your knee looks like on the inside. 
So I want to show you what your foot looks like on a real human skeleton. So we can see the toes or digits. We can see what are called the metatarsals, which are the longest bones of the foot, and they simply connect your digits to your ankle bones. And there are seven different ankle bones. We can see the cuboid right here, the cuneiforms. This one is called the navicular. And up here it's a little difficult to see, but we have the talus, which is going to be immediately underneath the tibia. And, but my favorite one is this one over here. This is called the calcaneus, which literally means heel bone. And back here, this is where the Achilles tendon and gastrocnemius and soleus muscles are going to attach. But this, yeah, this is what your foot looks like underneath all your tissue. This is a really cool piece of tissue called the retinaculum. And what it's going to do is it's going to strap down the tendons of the muscles of the forearm as they enter into the hand. You see, without this wristband-like tissue, every time you'd extend your wrist and digits, the tendons would kind of just flip up. So luckily, we have this retinaculum that's going to bind those tendons down. This might be a little surprising because I know it doesn't look like it, but there is a muscle inside of this tissue that's draping over the clavicle going towards your pecs. You see, this is a muscle called platysma, and if we look very closely, you're going to be able to see these little fibers running through it. And you might be wondering, what does this muscle do? So the only way to do this is to look ridiculous. So go ahead and commit to the moment and go for it, because you're going to lower your jaw and flare out your neck. It's going to look like this. Do you see all the tension that's happening there? It's like these cables are coming out. That's my platysma muscle. Platysma is a very tightening muscle that just puts all this tension on the front of your neck. The funny bone isn't actually a bone. It's a nerve that travels behind this inner part of your elbow called the medial epicondyle and travels down your forearm until it gets to your hand where it innervates your pinky and half of your ring finger. It's called the ulnar nerve. So if you ever hit this inner part of your elbow, you are hitting a nerve and it's sending a zinging sensation down to your hand. The reason why they call it the funny bone is because this bone here is called the humerus and well, that's supposed to be funny. Let's talk about golfer's elbow because that's an irritation and aggravation of this inside area of your elbow. Now you see, this little area is attached to several of the muscles in your anterior forearm. So this would be kind of like this, so the muscles in that area of the forearm. So let's say you're doing some kind of activity where you're gripping really hard. Say maybe you are a mechanic or something like that. All of these muscles are going to be contracting and that can put tension on this attachment site. And then it could get swelling or just irritation and pain and we call that golfer's elbow. We've had a lot of requests to go over growing pains. So growing pains are gonna be felt typically here in the front of the thigh and then on the back side of the calf and the back side of the knee. But we honestly don't know what growing pains are. But I go into a lot more depth in a YouTube video. So if you wanna head over to our YouTube channel, you can see me explain in a lot more depth what is growing pains. Let's talk about a tissue that is fundamental to biology and it's called connective tissue. You see this stuff that looks almost like cobwebs? These are collagen proteins that help keep every single one of your muscle cells, and in fact, everything inside of your body connected. If you've ever dislocated a rib, that happened back here. You see the ribs physically connect to your backbones or your vertebra, and if they pop off, we call that a subluxation, and you might even be able to feel that as you would palpate or poke your back, and it might feel like a muscle knot or a big nodule. On the other hand, if your ribs separate from the cartilage that attaches it to the sternum, that's called a costocartilage separation. Now, this isn't real cartilage. The soft tissue doesn't hang around as you preserve this skeleton. But if this bone were to separate from the cartilage, that would be much more severe. And that typically happens due to an impact or some kind of trauma to the front, such as a car crash and the seatbelt compresses it. Okay, so what I'm holding here is a real left human hip. You see, it would rest just like this in the skeleton or just like this in me. But what I wanna look at is on the posterior side. This is the gluteus maximus muscle. And I can even open it up and as I do that, you can see all this really cool musculature, including some nerves. 
What you're looking at here is a real human mandible, or what most people would call the jaw. Now, if we look closely, we can see where all the lower teeth would be. You can even see kind of like that spongy bone that I've mentioned in previous videos. But what's really cool is you see this hole here, and there's another one on the other side. Those are supposed to be there. Those are called the mental foramina, and those are where blood vessels and nerves come out of. But, I don't know, I've always thought the mandible is a really cool, interesting looking bone. What you're looking at here is a lower leg, but what I want to focus on is this thing. This is the tibia, or your shin bone, and you'll notice we've cut a little window into it. That's because I wanted to show you that your tibia, just like all other long bones, is hollow on the inside. Right? That's called your medullary cavity. Now what you'd normally find in there would be yellow bone marrow, which is another type of fat storage. The question that I get a lot is, what is the difference between muscle tissue and tendons? You see, tendons emerge from muscles. Muscles are normally wrapped in a bunch of connective tissue layers. So as the muscle cells end, the connective tissue layers continue on. And what happens is they then blend with a bone and they cross a joint. So when the proteins of the muscle contract, it ends up pulling on the tendon, which causes a movement to occur at the joint. What you're looking at here is a real human skull with the top removed, so we can see inside of what's called the cranial vault or neurocranium. Now obviously what would go inside of there would be the brain, or two hemispheres. But that is the location of your brain. I want to show you the longest muscle in the human body. You see, this is called the sartorius muscle. Now, its length obviously is going to be different depending on how tall you are, but this muscle comes from all the way up here in the hip, and it travels down and goes past your knee. So what you're looking at here is the back of the thigh, so these would be the hamstrings, but I want to show you a really special hamstring here called semitendinosus. Now, it's called semitendinosus because while a lot of it and most of it is muscle, there is a considerable amount that is tendinous. And in fact, with this muscle, sometimes they will take part of it and use that as an ACL replacement for the ligament in the knee. What I have here is a real human vertebra or backbone. Now this comes from the thoracic region or where your ribs would be located, but I want to talk about one of the most important functions of vertebrae and that's to protect your spinal cord. If we pretend my finger is your spinal cord, you can see that it has this bony protection that goes around it. So not only do bones support weight, just as this vertebra does, but it also acts as a protector for neurological tissue. So cool. I want to talk all about shin splints. So you see right here, this is your shin bone or your tibia, and it's covered in a piece of tissue called the periosteum. Now over here, we can see what's called fascia, and that's on top of muscles. There's a very unique relationship that these have to one another, and you can see that the fascia blends into the periosteum. One of the leading theories as to what shin splints is, is that this fascia causes an irritation and inflammation of the periosteum, and that can create a lot of pain. But there's other theories, and if you're interested, I filmed a longer YouTube video all about shin splints that you can go ahead and look at now on our YouTube channel. Fun fact, but this triangle-shaped bone here called the sacrum used to be five separate bones, and they all started fusing around age 16 to 18 and fully fuse by the ages 26 to 30. But down here, this little bone here called the coccyx, or what most people would refer to as the tailbone, this sometimes doesn't fuse at all over your entire life. And in other people, it starts fusing very soon. You see that we had, an, where this glue is, shows you that this lower portion wasn't fused to this upper portion, and this upper portion wasn't fused to the sacrum. This also is variable. You can see this cadaver had four different coccygeal vertebrae, but some people have as little as three, and some have as many as five. I wanna talk about your calf muscles. This is called gastrocnemius, so this is one head and a second head of it, and if I move that over, we can see soleus on the other side. Both soleus and gastrocnemius are going to turn into one gigantic tendon, which we call the Achilles tendon. Some of you have an extra rib. It would happen all the way up here, coming off of this seventh cervical vertebra, and it would project towards your shoulder like this. We call it a cervical rib. Now, the only way to know for sure if you have it would be to take tests, such as an x-ray. But it's interesting to note that how much humans vary from person to person. 
Let's take another look at my real human skeleton to talk about a broken wrist. You see, the wrist is more of a region as opposed to one singular structure. Inside of your wrist, you have eight little carpal bones, and you also have the radius and ulna. If you break your wrist, typically it's going to be right around here on the radius, but it could be this bone, the scaphoid. In fact, it could be any number of these bones breaking in any number of ways. I want to take a look at these extremely deep muscles in your back. You see, these are below or deep to the latissimus dorsi muscle. So we've removed this muscle on this side. And what you can see are these back strap muscles. And there are three that are, that are visible. We have a really small one here, another one from here to here, and then another one like this. Now these three muscles are going to run from the low back pretty much up into the neck. And what they do is maintain posture. You see, without them, you would be unable to extend your back or slowly guide yourself forward. These are working regardless whether you're sitting or standing. These are some of the hardest working muscles in your body.